Well, did we lose many Skypers? Okay, don't tell me their names. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, she does this all the time. Geraldine, you crazy for Jesus. You crazy for Jesus. And we love you. Amen. Okay, let's... No working? <laughs> my, my... Yeah, mine is so... My battery is so low, I don't know. But we'll, we've got it, and we can... <clears throat> okay. All right, so we've been in Genesis chapter 12, and I'll give you a little summary leading up to that, um, because we're going to be in, start in Genesis 13 tonight. All right, so <clears throat> in, um, in Genesis chapter 11, we had God... Um, intervene in the life of uh, this particular family and Terah was the father and Abraham was one of the sons and uh, Haran and Nor Norhay anyway Nor Norman <laughs> and, and uh, 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 Haman died back in the Ur of Chaldees. Uh, Haman, sorry. Haran died. I am not only mixing metaphors, I am <laughs> mixing stories in the Bible. And um, the other brother stayed there, and but, but, um, Haran's son, the one who died, his son came with Abraham and Terah and all that they brought with them <clears throat> into um, a place that was named Haran, but it was still outside of the land. <clears throat> uh, and at that point, they had not entered in, but the thing that you have to realize is that God himself, out of all the people in the world and of all the people that were in Babylon, which the Ur of Chaldees was considered that place, country, <clears throat> that God spoke to one family and the, and the subject of that, uh, <clears throat> that dealing would be that God wants his firstborn son. That's it. And <clears throat> that theme will, will not just stay within the realm of Abraham and the, his, his firstborn son that will come, um, Isaac. Um, it will move into the realm of Isaac's son and it will move into the realm of Jacob's son and it will fill the book of Genesis and it will be the very heart of God who is desirous that his firstborn, which in the New Testament you can read it, Jesus is the firstborn son. Um, <clears throat> and that we might be conformed to the image of his son. And uh, <clears throat> it is that firstborn. It is the firstborn. So that um, the father all the way back at the beginning uh, of dealing with man. Uh, and of course, we went back even before this in relationship to the, the subject. Uh, we saw it in Exodus and we also saw it in Cain and Abel. <clears throat> uh, that, that there's a particular son that God wants and that son is, yes, the title is firstborn. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory, but it is, um, it is a son of a certain nature. It is the son of the father's love. It is the son of a certain nature. It is the son of the father's love. Okay. And Paul caught hold of that in, uh, in his writings, and particularly you see it in, Ephesus, uh, in, uh, in his letter to the Ephesians, 
when he starts off, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all blessings in heavenly places in Christ, we noticed that it all sprang from the Father. <clears throat> well, Jesus is the son of that Father's love. He, that, and I'm not just, let me, let me qualify that. I'm not just saying that he's the object of the Father's love. Yes, 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 and yes. But it is also saying that he is the nature of that. He is the son of the Father's love. That birth, you could say it almost birthed him, as it were, as a son. The Father's love. It's a son of the Father's love. And <clears throat> that spirit, that nature, that way glorifies the Father because he has one after his likeness. And remember, that was the first words in Genesis when God spoke concerning man before he was created. He didn't say, well, let's, let's do this or that. Or all the things that religion says and all the things that people who, who are not believers say, it was... Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. That's his first words pertaining to man. And then he did it. He didn't make it and then say it. He said it and then made it. And so that's, the <clears throat> that's always been the goal. But the problem was is that the true image is Christ. He is, and what does it say in Hebrews? That he is the, in, he is the express image of the invisible God. So... So this, so God intervenes in this family, and He does so because He He believes that there is hope for what is in His heart to come into them, and for them to begin to strive towards that end. Now, you get a big dose of that in the book of Galatians. <laughs> you do. You get a huge huge dose of that in there um, where it's you know I mean it's just full full of that subject um, even beyond what we have discussed in in cross principles class um, and so it's like a this 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 spawning of something to begin to bring forth something to have it manifest eventually to work with it, to, to water it, to, to plan it, to, you know, but eventually for it to bring forth an increase of what is in his heart. And it happens with this man, Abraham, the son of Terah. The son of Terah <coughs> hears from God while he is yet in the Ur of Chaldees, or while he is in Haran, and says, you know, come into the land, okay? And when he gets in there, then that same God speaks to him again, and he says, it's not really going to be about you, first and foremost. It's going to be about the son that is impossible, the one that is impossible for you to bring forth. Amen. <laughs> um, and that was, you know, you know, you're old and Sarah is barren. So you, there's just no hope for you. See, that's the way, you know. But that's our mind. And once we, we can get out of our realm and ourselves and everything, and we just begin to, we, we've, it's like uh, Jacob, you know, there's ladders with the angels ascending and descending, messengers. The word angel is really messenger of, of that reality coming down and, and us sending back up of that reality, um, <clears throat> then, then our lives are different. Then we are involved in something that is eternal, that has nothing to do with us, that we, in the sense of uh, how important we are or how much we've done for God, or our, it just, that, that just looks so petty to us. And we just go, I just want you to get your son. And so, he is, uh, Abraham has just barely gotten to the land, and when he gets in there, he immediately starts building altars. And um, so he comes up to the point, and this is chapter 12, he comes up to the point where he is, he's in the land, and he's between Ai and um, Bethel, uh, house of God. And... Uh, 
he goes in either direction. He goes straight down into Egypt, and the scriptures tell us why, because there was a great famine in the land. Okay, and this is, this is what moves us, folks. We, we may be chosen. We may be, have all this potential. But until the Spirit of God gets hold of us beyond our little lives for, for him, <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to self-protect. We're going to think of self first. We're going to, <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to take the path that we feel is best for us. And that path was, there's a famine in the land of promise. Well, maybe you just don't understand what God's doing. See, you, you may understand, like, like the prodigal son, <clears throat> you may understand famine, but you don't understand God. You know, and your understanding of famine perverts your understanding of God because you only see by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he goes down into Egypt and <clears throat> big mess transpires. And um, so finally they come out and because of, because of the, the cursed one, Sarah, it says because of her, um, that the king uh, down there looked with favor on them and sent them out with um, sheep and goats and all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, and so we come to Genesis 13, um, <clears throat> and we see that they didn't just escape uh, Egypt. They came out with riches. You do know that that's the same thing that happened to Israel when they were in Egypt. They didn't just escape. They did, but they came out with riches and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> okay, so so let's just let's just examine the comparison of those two because we we've talked much about the, that reality of of the prodigal son, the famine, and we see it with Abraham, and he's going to see it with Israel and Exodus, and on and on. Or we've already seen it actually when we covered it. Um, <clears throat> those um, comparisons. Uh, so, so you hear someone preach about <clears throat> um, what does it say in one of the Psalms? He brought them out with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble among their tribe. And they had, you know, you <clears throat> it it, it uh, says all this stuff. And so you have you have preachers that get hold of that, and they say, "Praise God, you might have been in bondage." And you might have been bad, but God brought you out, and he made you wealthy, and he did this for you. And, you know, there's all this wealth, you know, whether they spiritualize it or they make it just literal, you know, you're going to be, you know, prosperous. <clears throat> um, we find the true story of what happened and why as we proceed with them. Now we're talking about Exodus, okay? But remember, Abraham and them came out with all those riches and stuff, too. <clears throat> so they come out of Egypt, uh, and uh, they're delivered, and they see Pharaoh and his armies. Uh, the seas close up, and they see him die. And so they're, um, <clears throat> they're going through the wilderness, and they're, they're hungry, and they're thirsty, and God has to do things for them to... And it's always a picture of Christ crucified when he does something. Um, uh, the water is poisoned here, so he takes a, a part of a tree. He throws it in there, and the tree heals the water. You know, the tree, uh, is, that's a reference to the cross, and it's used in the New Testament. <clears throat> so... They're going. They're kind of doing like what Abraham was. They're going, man. We're going from one crisis to the next here. You know, they never see the rock smitten and out of it flows. It represents Christ being crucified. They never see the spirit behind God. They only see the miracles. And to God, it's not a miracle. The lamb slain wasn't a miracle. And they should have seen that when they, when they, first got ready to come out. But they they don't see that way. It's their vision is on themselves and we need a miracle. <clears throat> uh, and however, you know, let me make sure. I believe in miracles and I thank God for them and we could never have survived without them. But I believe that we'd survive not because of a miracle. We survived because we, in, our goal from the very beginning was that the father would get his son. And so he's kind of stuck with us because that's what 
<coughs> All right. <coughs> so now you have you have uh, Israel in the wilderness, and they're just everything is bad. You know, the promised land is not good. Okay, back to Abraham. There's a famine. The promised land is not good. You know. <coughs> So in, in Egypt, or out of Egypt, Israel says, well, this is really bad. Let us return to Egypt. At least there we had leeks and garlic. So <clears throat> totally just oblivious. Just, just, well, there's a God up there. We believe that. We've seen the miracle. So, so he's a miracle-working God, but he doesn't seem to be real consistent with it. He's not showing up when we want him, okay? Because <clears throat> we're the gods, and he needs to take care of us, right? And he needs to be the servant to the gods, us. <clears throat> that was sort of their attitude. Um, so, they, so, you know, when you're starving or you're dying of thirst and it's rough going and you're in a wilderness and all this kind of stuff, you're going, you know, what the heck good is all these sheep and all these lambs and all this stuff because we're all going to die out here. You know, and what is all the good of all these riches, this, uh, this gold that he brought us out with gold and silver? What is all the point of this if we're just going to die out here? This is rough. Okay? Can you, all, can you see that? Can you see that that would be the case? All right. So <clears throat> they get to Mount Sinai, and there God appears to them, and God finally starts opening the, the reason. Take all of the women's brass earrings and make a, a labor for the, the tabernacle and take all the gold, and we're going to make a, a um, uh, uh, ark, and we're going to make a candlestick, and we're going to make, you know, we're going to do all this stuff and, and all of these special clothing and stuff, and, and I'm going to have a guy. God's got a guy. You know. His name's Bezalel, who represents the Holy Spirit. And he's the one who starts putting together all this stuff and weaves it into what God wanted. And all of a sudden you see, oh my God, all this gold was really to represent his son and represent the cross and represent an altar here. And represent, oh, and he gave us all these lambs and sheep. Oh, wow. And now we have purpose. And now we understand. And, you know, he's trying to bring us to that. If he's doing good stuff for you, praise God, but he's not doing good stuff for you. He's trying to get you in a place where you just want, I just want to bring forth your son to you, Father. I just want to live that way. You know, <clears throat> so, so we see Abraham coming out with riches and sheep and all this stuff. And he's got all, he's looking good now, you know, and uh, let's see. So this is uh, Genesis 13, verse 1 and 2, and half the class is over, and I've already just finished the introduction. <clears throat> yeah, okay, yeah, there's that. <clears throat> and Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him, oh boy, this guy's hard to shake loose, into the south, because Lot, um, because Abram is still thinking on some level that this is the firstborn. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. So I'll just read a few of my notes here. As they leave Egypt, there must have been a sense that they were back under the provision and blessing of God. Okay, can I shoot down that phrase, under the provision and blessing of God, and just say the father heart of God for his son? We're under the father heart for his son instead of putting it in terms of earthly provision and earthly blessings and about me you, you see what i'm saying and uh, <clears throat> so this is what i meant in the last 
class where I was talking about a machete and trying to cut through all of this stuff. There's so much to cut through because we've made so many terms and so many things that rob us of the truth because it's all been brought down to us and then it's been, you know, told us you're, it's about you and it's about, you know, how important you are and everything. And, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, God, you know, the scripture when it says Christ in you, the hope of glory, it didn't just say Christ, the hope of glory. I mean, you are involved in this, Christ in you. Okay? He had Christ before the foundation of the world. What did he add? You. <laughs> okay. Okay? So, so I'm not trying to take that away from you or anything as if, you know, you're totally not important. But if Jesus was standing right here and not, not, not covered and shaded in any way, but just as he is, and you were standing here, which one would shine brighter? <laughs> you know? Well, what did they do throughout the Bible when they saw him? They fell down on their face. They didn't go, ah, yeah, you're looking good and so am I. You know, some sort of spirit like that. <clears throat> but it's easy to do that when we don't see him. But if you start seeing him, you're going to quit doing a bunch of that stuff because you're going to be on your face. You know, and ultimately you'll be on a cross with him yeah. and rejoicing that, good, this needs to go, that needs, you know, right? Empty what is full, fill what is empty. All right, <clears throat> so, uh, and by letting Sarah leave with her husband means that Pharaoh let their future beloved son their firstborn, Isaac, go also. Oh, yeah, he wasn't born yet, but he wasn't born in God's heart. So he was already there. So guess what? What do they let him go out of Egypt? The firstborn son. <laughs> you see that? Is that wonderful? He's preserving that. Because remember, Abraham could have died. Sarah could have stayed barren but he's preserving them so that they can bring forth the firstborn. All right. Um, this would be the eternal call given by Moses to let God's firstborn leave Egypt. In like manner as to Egypt regarding Abraham's situation, the plague quite possibly could have killed the firstborn of Egypt or of Pharaoh had Pharaoh not let Sarah go. So in letting Abram go and not killing him, Pharaoh may have spared his firstborn son. Again, it certainly spared Abraham's. We may assume that the God who would one day spare Israel's firstborn in Egypt did the same here with the father of Israel and his firstborn. When Israel went into Egypt, it did not go in as a great nation, but as the sons of Jacob. However, it came out as a great nation. Okay. <clears throat> and you remember all that I, the dividing between the firstborn coming out and just Israel being delivered. All right, I won't go back through all that. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about Lot a little bit. Maybe I should just read here. Yeah, let me just, no, let me just read my notes here. And then we'll read the scripture, God's view of Lot as the firstborn. In Genesis 13, we have the situation with Lot. An argument arose between Lot and Abraham pertaining to their herds, though it was, uh, was to Abram to whom God had given the land. Okay, so this argument happened, but God had given the land to Abram. But he had given it to his seed too, to Abram as, and his seed, what he's going to bring forth out of them. Is that right? Mm -hmm. He gave it to Abraham and his seed. And this, where do we get that from? Galatians 3.16, Galatians again. Hmm, maybe the Lord's saying you should study Galatians a little more. I don't know, maybe not. <clears throat> um, 
Though it was to Abram to whom God had given the land, Abram gave Lot his pick of the choicest part of the land. But he chose, but Lot chose Sodom for its beauty and was quite content to move away, which was a form of exile. In God's heart, it was a form of exile. It's the same thing as the prodigal going out. It's, it's the same story that you're going to find with Jacob. You're going to see this exile thing over and over and over. <coughs> and All right. So let's start with verse 3. <coughs> and he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai unto the place of the altar. So what did he do? He was in Egypt. All that junk happened. And he, when he leaves Egypt, he makes a straight shot for the altar. He goes back to the altar. He goes back to the last place he was, he, God had spoken to him. He goes back to where he senses this is where the heart of God rests, not in riches, not in Egypt, but here at the altar. And so he makes a straight shot, and that's where he goes. And that's where our heart needs to begin to be trained, folks. It is so easy to get off. It is so easy to get, you know. I mean, I, you know what? I remember when I was in Bible school, <clears throat> this was back, me and Moses were in the same class. You know? uh, anyway, I remember the Spirit of God was teaching me this and was showing it to me in the Word of God, and it was just like blowing my mind, and it was it captivated me, and I, I had a Bible with me all the time, and I was always sharing, you know, lunchtime, anytime, all the time, you know, when, when the teacher was late for class, I'd get up there and say, look, I'm nobody, but look what I just found. <laughs> Remember that? I would just go, you know, I know, I shouldn't be up here, because we were just sitting there. Everybody would just sit there waiting on the teacher, and I'm going, we could be talking about Jesus, <laughs> you know, I wasn't trying to show off. I just was overjoyed, and just sharing that, and I, but I remember he was just filling me up, and then um, I would go visit some church with a friend or something like that, or uh, and I would hear somebody preach, and it would be a completely different message, and it would it would throw me off. It actually would. It would throw me off because I'd go because it's it sounded right, and they were quoting scriptures and everything, you know. But I didn't know enough yet. I was still I was barely getting the word in me. And I would just go, ah, you know, it was like, Ooh. you know, it's like, Lord, my spirit's with you, but my mind's freaking out here because I can't, how do you jive this, this stuff with what I'm seeing? And yet, you know, it sounds like he's preaching from the word and all this. And <clears throat> it just, it just messed with me, you know, it messed with me. And part of the reason why it was messing with me is because I was wanting everything to just say it the way I had, the little bit I had already seen. Well, it does, but you're not going to know, but in the volume of the book it is written in there, you're not going to know Jesus in every part of this until you've been soaking and saturating and saying, I want you, and you know, because you can sit here and read this thing and get all kind of stuff out of it. You know, you can read a story like Abraham or any story and you can say, and the, and the moral of the story is, is that we need to be faithful to God. You know, you know what I mean? Well, no, we don't. We're not faithful. You know, <laughs> what we need is the son formed in us who is, has, when he comes back on his vesture, faithful and true. And we go, there, there he is. And here he was. And if there's any faithfulness, that was you. And that's why I'm falling down on my face right now. See? <clears throat> so, so, you know, I remember the, the confusion, you know, and you're going, well, you know. And so in my mind, I said, because uh, that happened actually several different times. And we even had a, a Bible school student or a Bible school teacher that would just go off on weird stuff or, or probably wasn't weird stuff is probably your basic view of things but it would just mess with me and I and I said Lord you know you say in your word that we should be instant in season and out of season and I said I am not in any kind of a 
place to do that. I, I can't just pull up and go, oh, buddy, look right here. <laughs> you know, I, I'm nowhere near that. I, you know, and it was also it was good for me because it was also keeping me low. Because you start seeing, I mean, this is pretty good stuff when you start seeing it in the Word and go, oh my God, you know. But then something in you can rise. You can, you can, you can say, well, God's showing me this because I'm so special, you know. <laughs> and, you know, that's not where he's, he wants your heart to go. So he was, he was continually confused and bringing in this stuff. And, and it, was, it was good. It was good. The law of contrast. The law of contrast is powerful. And you can, you can have something shown to you or preached uh, in the scripture that is a good message and whatever, but it's not Christ. And you can go, okay, well, you know, you, you tuck that inside of you because you want to know, you want to you wanna gather up as much of the Bible that you can get in you. And then all of a sudden the Spirit of God shows you Christ there and the law of contrast just rips apart the confusion. It's just like, you know, the, the example of that, excuse me one minute, the example of that is, is the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, and, you know, the, Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Peter and James and John are there with him, and all of a sudden, Elijah, Moses and Elijah appear up there, and it's starting to look like a pretty spiritual group, and it's like, wow, there's some top-notch dudes here we got working here. And God goes, I won't have it. And he overshadows with a cloud all of it but Jesus. And he says, this is my beloved son. Hear him. That's the father. That's the father. He's going, you know, you think Moses and Elijah, the only thing they had was me, you know. You think any of the, that Peter and James and John are superheroes? They're fixing to run from the cross, you know? You need to, you need, you need to get your mind right. <laughs> because that's, that reality has to, has to, and it, it doesn't happen overnight, but it has to sink in. It has to seep in. It has to, you know, not I, but Christ is not my pet doctrine. He must be my life and my nature. He must be the spirit in which I treat people, the way that I, I am uh, when I'm not on guard. That, and the way that that happens is he gets revealed in you and then when something comes along that's a contrast, it doesn't confuse you because you, you know what the Father's heart is and you've had the Son revealed in you and it contrasted you first. It contrasted you, and you went, yuck, to yourself. It was good. It was powerful. It was hard. It was yucky. It was wonderful. It was all of that. It was all of that. And, and then, now you have lamb's eyes. Now you see, and, and you, you, know, you don't have a hard time with the scriptures. Or, you know, some, I, don't know the, I don't know everything in the scripture. I don't know every jot and tittle uh, seeing Christ in it. But I know every bit of it is Christ. <laughs> I may not know it all, but I know it is. And if somebody asks me, and many of you have done that, I've said, you know, I've never really seen the Lord there. You know, I remember some time ago, a long time ago, somebody said, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to know this stuff. I said, well, I do, but I don't know that. <laughs> so, you know, it's just this, this, this thing that's going on, and, and uh, you see that there's, there's confusion in, in Abraham's mind. There's confusion with, with why there's a famine right now, and God's not confused. A, the prodigal son, I, I really meant well, but, you know, God's not confused, even though he is. Israel in Egypt, down there, because of a famine. God's not confused. We're confused because we think that provision and direction and blessing is what it's all about. 
and it's going to take more than that to get his son out of this. If he, you know, if, if everything you eat is sweet, it's not good for you. It's just a thought. All right, where were we here? Um, between Bethel and Ai, verse 4, unto the place of the altar which he had made, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So he's like, I'm back with you now. Okay, now he could have just um, <clears throat> gone somewhere else. Let's say he went to another town, another village or something like that. And he went into, you know, the local uh, uh, hotel and said, hey, I got cash money, you know. And I want to tell everybody about what God's done for me. God made me rich. God, you know, God, God blesses me. How's your life? Maybe you need to follow the real God. Maybe you need God. Come right up and come to these altars and receive the God that, will never make you go to an altar again. <laughs> but he doesn't. He doesn't. He comes out with all of that and he goes straight to the altar where he was before the riches, before the provision, before all of that. And, and, and uh, you know, I've shared this with Ben and a lot of other people, but there is and, and you know a lot of us share on this subject but there is a big difference between God's purpose and his provision his provision is to get you to his purpose his provision is not for your flesh and the prodigal son missed that missed it <clears throat> so so you know it's like he comes out, and he, I mean, if you could put yourself in that position, he comes out, and man, I, I almost lost my life, but God saved me, and, and, and God protected me and Sarah, you know, and my wife, and, and God gave all this provision. You could go any number of places, but he's going, I need to get back to the Father. That's right. I got to go back to the cross, man. I got to go back to there. That's where it all happened. That's where I met with God. That's where God spoke to me. That's where uh, reality started happening. And I am going back to that altar. And when I get there, I'm going to call on the Lord. I'm going to call on him. I'm going to call on the God of the altar. And I'm going to find out what his will is. Well, <clears throat> As we can see, uh, it's funny because uh, verse 5 then, and Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks. That's the ver this is beginning the, the argument, the fight between uh, Abram's herdsmen and Lot's. Now, you remember Lot, Abraham, thought he was going to be the firstborn. But God is dealing with Abram. God is dealing with him. And he's getting his groove on a little bit now. He's going to start picking up a little bit of momentum now. It's going to start happening, you know. So he gets there, and he, he gets it by going back to the altar. You don't always do that, do you? You don't always go back to the cross. You, you keep on going until he knocks you in the head and says, it's that way. <laughs> well, stop it. <laughs> stop it. So he goes back there, and he's calling on the name of the Lord. And what starts happening? The next verse, it runs right into it. The next thing, verse 5, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. Uh-huh, okay. Well, <clears throat> we can say because their substance was great um, that they couldn't dwell together. But we know that there's a spiritual contrast at work there. What is of Abraham or Abram, what is of him now is the cross, is the altar. That's what he lives, that's what he's built all the way. The little bit of time that he's been in the land, he's built multiple altars 
and <clears throat> because he wants Christ crucified, because he wants this nature, because, but he doesn't fully understand what, what that is. But you know, you don't have to understand everything. Did you know that? You just have to get your heart right, but we're working on this. I gotta understand this. This doesn't make sense right now. Man, in my, like I said, in my early days, it was like, how is that? I, I mean, I remember reading one verse over in, in, Roman, in Romans 6, one verse over and over and over, and I go, what? Read it again. What? Read it again. What? Read it again. What? I mean, I, I'm serious. I spent like weeks and weeks just going, I'm going to go read something else because I'm not getting that. <laughs> then I'd come back and I go, read it again. What? I mean, it's like, and I know, and, it, and those scriptures are obviously talking about the cross. Those are obviously talking about our death with Christ and all of that. But for the life of me, my brain, because, you know, we, we don't have a, that mind, would, would, would not get it. And I remember... You know, and it was it wasn't instant. It wasn't in a week or a month or whatever. I mean, it was probably within a year of of I spent really concerted effort in Romans six and seven, where and some of you know that and have had it happen to you, where my pages were literally melting from from tears and sweat and and just going over it and over it. And of course, I I would you know I didn't just go. Well, I don't get this. I, I mean, I would just go, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so blind. I don't won't know what's wrong with me. And I remember tears falling down, and I go, this is going to mess up my Bible. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then I remember coming back after the Lord showed it to me, and then even years later in that same Bible, lost that Bible one day we were going out somewhere and I set it on top of the car you remember that and it was my first Bible my favorite Bible it was full of all of my notes it was full of just all kind of stuff and we drove off and it was oh my Bible where is it looked on top of the car and it was gone and so I wept the loss and then I said well Lord let somebody find that Bible and let all those tears and all that sweat over the wanting you, may they just read and go, oh, oh my God, <laughs> you know, that's Jesus. He probably laughed at me and had a dump truck run over it. And, you know, <laughs> seriously, you know, it was like, Randy, you're so cute. Not, you know. <laughs> um, but, the, you know, so <clears throat> the... Um, so this says uh, the substance was great so that they could not dwell together um, <clears throat> and there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle okay okay well if there's strife there then what does that mean what does it mean if there's strife betwe in between them going on what does it mean It means that the per the Perizzites and the Canaanites dwelled in the land then. That's the next verse. There's still junk inside of them. <laughs> There's still foreign entities in the land that they're supposed to drive out. Amen? That's, yeah, I figured you'd want to know that. That's, uh, yeah, verse uh, 6. 6 and 7, yeah. Yeah, 7. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the per Perizzite dwelt then in the land. You're just getting this feeling that there's some ugly entities, you know, spiritual whatever however you want to look at it but there's there's a strife going on and that's because there's something else there that is affecting what's going on 
And I'm not just talking about demons. I'm talking about there are entities in us, folks. There's stuff that needs to be dealt with in us that's us that is not conformed to the image of Christ, right? We all, we, we all have that. We all, none of us have completely are gone and now it's totally Christ. None of us. Like Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ. He's talking about Jesus. So, um, how much more time we got? Just want to make sure. 15 minutes. So, I should be able to at least read through this. Right. <clears throat> Verse 8. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. What kind of spirit is that? That sounds like my Jesus. That sounds like <clears throat> someone who is not caught up, and, you, and you'll see the rest of it, that's not caught up in the promise of the land as much as he wants the son to come forth. <clears throat> well, God gave this to me. He didn't say that, you know. Did, did you hear him a lot? Did you hear him say it to you? Huh? Okay. There shouldn't be any strife. It's mine. God gave it to me, and he'll strike you dead. See, he will. He'll strike you dead because I'm the one he chose. Okay, I'm the one. You're not. Okay, so there's this really scruffy part of the land, and you can just go there and be snotty. <clears throat> Verse 8 and... And Abram said unto Lot, <clears throat> see, he didn't say it to the herdsmen. Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. <clears throat> All right, so here, here we have someone with a completely different spirit. We have someone <clears throat> that is, you know, I mean, if we, here's what we, here's how we preach it. If God told you something, you need to stick with it. <clears throat> how about this? If God is in you, you're not going to care about all of that. You know, I've got to have this, or the Lord gave me that. The Lord gave me that. Because Abraham could say that. Abram could say that. The Lord gave me that. And, and you know, <clears throat> this is important. You see, it's always important. It's always important what he gave us, more important than other people, more important than anything. What he is doing in us is the most important thing so you're bad because you're crossing lines here. That's the way we think, see? And, and we get defensive and we get attitudes and we get strife and we get parasites and that's eating us from the inside. But if you, but if you to you, it's not based on Hold on to what God said or what he's given you. But it is hold on to the altar inside. Hold on to the nature. Hold on to Jesus and be content with him. <clears throat> then you literally say, look, man, I pray. Don't let there be any strife between. And then he's going to give a method because you can't change Lot. You can't change the parasites and the Canaanites. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to magically change them. You're, I'm talking about the people you're having a hard time with. <laughs> you do realize that. You know, I'm talking about them. You're not going to change them. <clears throat> so what does he do? He says, look, even though God had given it to me, but he didn't bring that up, did he? 
He didn't say, well, God did give this to me, so I want you to see how Christ-like I am. This is really the lamb. Oh, it's, oh, trust me, buddy. It's the lamb in me. Because I'd, I'd have killed you. <laughs> so, he says, look, the whole lamb, the whole lamb, the whole, every ounce of it is before you. If you want to go to the right hand, then you go there. I'll go to the left. If you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. It's hard to argue with the lamb. Nobody ever really goes, slaps the lamb and goes, shut up. <laughs> because he opened not his mouth, you know. But he's not going to intentionally offend because he just wants to die ultimately and start the change. You see that? Ultimately, that's what he's after. He's not, you know, Jesus standing before the Pharisees or before Pontius Pilate or before Herod or, you know, and he did make a remark and, and somebody slapped him and said, do you talk that way to the high priest? He knows that he's not going to change anybody by reasoning with them. Did you know that? You change them by going into death like Jesus did. You lay down your life for them. Okay? So if Abram didn't pick up on that early, if, he had, if there hadn't been a bunch of altars before this, he wouldn't have any clue. Who knows what he was thinking with each altar? Here's a lamb. I just killed it. I lay it here. This, the fragrance rises. God seems to accept this. There's something to this. Maybe this is supposed to be applied to me. Maybe this is wanting what he's really wanting from me, not just some sort of ministry thing that I do. And, and we see that, we see evidence of something like that already. Isn't that cool? Man, I love that. I love that. I love that spirit and I love that nature. <clears throat> so in verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Wow, I don't know how much time we got left, but did you hear what that all said? That, that wasn't just one little thing. There was a bunch of stuff in there. Lot lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld all the plain of the Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. <clears throat> all right. So the writer who writes this adds in one little thing that Lot didn't realize. Uh, it was really good looking until God <laughs> destroyed it all, you know. <clears throat> and he didn't do it just because of Lot. You do understand that, but let me tell you, your high and mighty and lofty choices that you think is going to lead you to the greatness that you deserve is just going to be the thing that destroys you. Your, the very way you think, your orientation of being up and not getting low, God exalts the low. He brings that down. Are you crazy? <laughs> Seriously, are you crazy? But you're going to keep pursuing that? You're going to keep thinking that way? You're not going to change your orientation? You're going, to, you're going to do that so that God can eventually bring you down. And that bringing down does not guarantee a lowliness that he'll exalt. It's just you brought down. There's a difference between lowliness and being brought down. You know. <clears throat> so, so we see this. We, we're seeing this contrast. No wonder there's strife between my herdsmen. We see this contrast. We see one that has no desire 
to claim the best or the worst or he just has this way, this nature within him. And there's an assurance in that. You know, I, I said something recently. Peace, I said, peace with God. You have peace with God that. Most people, even Christians, don't have peace with God. They wonder if, they're, if God's going to strike them dead tomorrow or if they're going to not be saved or if this or that. or da, 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 da. Peace with God is I'm with him. I'm not, you know, my peace does, it's not peace with my circumstances. You know, yeah, I have peace with God. If he said this is mine, he'll have to work that out. Oh, no, no, I'm going to make this move right here and I'll circumvent them and show them. Right? <clears throat> because we, why do we do that? Because we thoroughly believe that's the way to get what we want. We thoroughly believe that. I'm stepping on anybody it takes to get there. We believe that. And, and it's going to take a huge move of God by showing us the, the lamb that God honors above everything else and to see that that's what he was honoring when he raised him when he exalted him he's not just raising him from the dead he's exalted him above every name that is named and he's saying that's what i exalt that's what i love and and how did he get there well you can read it in philippians 2 verse 1 through 11 so lot starts the process of his own destruction. Well, God destroyed that, and he did it, and he just paid Lot back. It wasn't about Lot to God. He didn't do that because of Lot. That wasn't what was going on. Lot destroyed Lot. Lot messed up. Lot put himself first. Lot sought the highest seat. And, I, you know, I'm going to just say this one more time. Or make it one more turn so I don't ever have to keep saying this. <clears throat> the lowest seat, Jesus said, instead of going up to a higher seat, take the lowest seat. I'm just going to tell you, the lowest seat is the best seat, the highest seat, the honorable seat to God. It is the seat you should choose. It is not bad. It is not evil. It is not something you put up with for a time so that he'll bring you up. See, just the fact that he says, take the lowest seat, and, you know, if somebody says they'll come up here, then you'll do it. So there you have. The prideful person will eventually choose the lowest seat so he can get higher. But, he, but even if God exalts him and lets him get higher, he's off. He's wrong. He's out of whack with God. He doesn't understand. It doesn't matter how much you say to him or whatever. That lowest seat is the highest place that you can choose if you've got the lamb living in you, that you, you go over there and you say, I will sit here. I will do this for the others. Let them be blessed. Let them be. And this is what Abraham did with Lot. I will let them be blessed. I will let them be thought of higher. I don't have to have that. I don't have to have this land. I don't have to have the, a higher place or the highest seat. I don't even want it. I just want to let the life of the lamb live and, and manifest through me. And, and to see others blessed. It's not about me being blessed, me being honored, me da-da-da-da. And, and anything that says the opposite of that, folks, is not God's son. How much time we got left? All right. So maybe I will come back to this. Next, next time. Uh, but I'll end with this. The lowest seat is not the worst seat. It is not a dishonorable place. It is not uh, a, a, it is not, um, uh, it is not purgatory <laughs> for you Catholics. <laughs> it's a, a resting place for you to be able to move on to something greater. It is, it is what is greater. 
he that will be greatest among you, because they say, well, Lord, where will I, can we sit on your left and right? He that will be greatest among you shall be servant of all. Well, I hear you, Lord. I quote it all the time. But I will not stay in that lowest seat very long because I know that it's a place of shame or of, of you know, it's going to make me look bad. Or it's, it's, it's just God's passageway like purgatory to something greater. He's, it's a holding place for me until I'm really honored for who I am. I'm t- okay, so I'm going to run over my minute here. I, don't, I really don't care. <coughs> You can, you, can, you can keep thinking that way. You can, and, and, you know, I'm sorry I'm doing this. You can keep thinking that way, but I guarantee what's going to happen is what happened to Lot. You're going to miss out. You're going to be, you're going to wonder why every, my happy life in, in Sodom ended this way, and now I'm out in the mountains, and da-da-da-da, and my wife's turned into a pillar of salt, and, the whole thing with the daughters and all this stuff. You get, you, you, you'll be so far from God that you'll be an enemy of what is God, which Moab is where they came from, and that's what it is. You'll be an enemy of what really is of God, and you will always wonder why, you know, uh, I was with Abraham. I, you know, can you hear Lot? I was, hey, I was with the man. I was, I came out of that. I know, I know this stuff better than anybody. So why am I the one that seems to be the outcast and everything here? Because you can't handle the lowest seat. You don't love the lowest seat. You don't desire the lowest seat because you keep fighting and scraping and clawing your way to get higher. Somehow I'm going to be with the Lord and it's going to end up in greatness for me in some manner and you know, clearly, you're not seeking the lamb at all. You don't want the lamb. You want you. So, will I ever share on the lower seat again? I will, and I'll slam you every time because it's the truth. I will. Because once in your heart, listen to this, once in your heart, you get this settled that I just want Jesus in the way that he wants to be wanted, you will love the lowest seat. It will not be a thing of shame to you. It will be. They may look at you with shame, but you're going, because they looked at Jesus when he was standing there and beaten and slapped and bloody and everything else and fixing to be hung on a cross, and they, they saw it as shame. He's doing it for them. He's, he's, not a, he's not being murdered. He's a sacrifice for them, not for himself. Can I get an old me? <laughs> so yeah, I will. I will revisit this over and over again because we, as our orientation on understanding what's up and what's down has to change. And, and we will never, ever, ever, ever really know this God that is the God of the universe until that happens. We'll never know them them you'll know of them you'll know that there's a father and there's a son and there's you know and you'll know scriptures and you'll know this but you'll never really know them because you've painted a, a, a perverted picture of who they are and that perverted picture has to do with making you something so shall we pray <laughs> father i I know that your spirit is on me to share these things and just to not to rebuke or to, Lord, do whatever, condemn, but I know that your spirit is on me to break through strongholds and and run through a troop and leap over a wall because we're, we're so, so, uh, you know, just desiring for for something greater pertaining to us and we're missing it we're missing you we're missing you we we're we're proclaiming you to be something that you're not and you don't want it and you told us from the very beginning not to make idols no make any graven images of you and from the very beginning 
from the very beginning, you've offered lambs over and over and over all through the whole Bible and said, this is the thing that turns the tables. And then one day in real life, you sent your son and he was accused and looked down on and he, he not only took the lower seat, he did it to your glory, Father. Pleased you to bruise him because you knew that he was going to be exalted above all because that's he wouldn't want that he didn't do that he did that for us so that we would but in your heart you exalted him he never exalted himself in that so father help us help us help us help us in the name of Jesus and to the glory of your nature to find you in your name. Amen. All right. Well, happy.